Uh, yes, it's Dr. Traub, Steve Traub, uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're going to do a five-part series on uh, dental implants. And the first one here is going to be the historical perspective and my experience over the past 35 years. Uh, before I start, though, I need to say that I have no proprietary interest of any kind, nor uh, any interest in any sort of dental implant company or other product that I might mention throughout this entire lecture, and I never have. Prior to doing implants, I did explants. Explants are bullets taken out of people's faces. And so <clears throat> uh, we call it the cold steel and sunshine technique. So <clears throat> having left Chicago and uh, moved to Albuquerque, that's when I started my implant practice. I'm going to divide it into two uh, sections, the BC, which meant before cylinder. And in that regard, there are multiple different kinds of implants that were being done in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, such as blades, subperiosteal implants, and ramus frame implants. And then when I got started, it was mandibular staple bone plates, which were a premier implant. After staples came the uh, um, Branamark system, and we call that the AB after Branamark. This is the cylinder screws that are now popularly done in people's jaws all of the time. And again, I've used multiple systems over the years, including Nobel, IMZ Interpor, Stereos, ITI or Strawman implants. Nobel Pharma, and at present, I'm doing the Biomet 3i system, which has recently been bought up by Zimmer. Getting back to the beginning, mandibular staple bone plates are put in externally uh, from underneath the chin, and here you can see this is immediately after placement. Over a period of uh, seven to eight years, I did seven of these about once a year, and that's when implants were not in vogue. And so there was a lot of resistance, uh, mostly in the dental community, uh, not wanting to get on the bandwagon with the implants because they were considered experimental. Nevertheless, we got excellent results. And in the long-term studies of this particular implant, there was a 95 plus percent success rate uh, over 10 years at least. The material is a little different than the, those that we use today in that it was an alloy using titanium, vanadium, and aluminum. Uh, at the same time, it was done differently than in the office like we do now. This is from a submental approach, meaning underneath the chin with an incision, incision through skin and in the hospital under, under general anesthesia. Uh, these cases were best uh, done if there was a vestibuloplasty performed ahead of time to provide keratinized tissue in the mandible for the implant to come up through. The long-term research on this was done by Dr. Irwin Small up in Michigan. Uh, you can see on the slides here the immediate post-operative result with the posts coming up through the uh, mandibular alveolus. And then you move to the opposite slide where you can see the connecting bar that was put on and a well-healed vestibuloplasty. This is the first place, the first uh, case I ever did with placement of a mandibular staple bone plate. It's in a 32-year-old female who had TMJ problems as well as a loose lower denture. And the surgery was done in February of 1982 when I'd only been in practice for six months. In fact, I had to fly to Wisconsin just to take the course on how to do this. And so you can see her picture here. And remember that for the one I'll show you in just a few minutes where she is 35 years later. Here's a picture of her mandible uh, on Panorex, and it's an old, old film, but it shows significant resorption from wearing a denture since the time it was 18 years old. Here's our immediate post-op film where you can see the implant coming up through the bone, and there's a slight difference in the levels of the uh, uh, abutments, but that's only due to because of the uh, irregular resorptive pattern of her mandible. Ultimately, a bar was made, and then the dentures were made to fit onto the bar, and that's what this x-ray uh, shows here. Further on down the road, uh, she uh, underwent placement of implants in the maxilla as well, because you can see there's significant resorption there also. So two bars were fabricated stabilization of her maxillary denture. After about 25 years, uh, she started to have problems uh, around one of the uh, uh, abutments, uh, the one on the right side with recurrent uh, soft tissue infection. And this is primarily due to the coarseness of the uh, uh, 
and the thread pattern on the mandibular staple. Again, you have to remember that this was a first generation implant. And so um, it appeared that the best solution was, was to uh, remove her bar and cut the implant off at the bone level and then place two cylinder implants, as you can see are done here uh, from above. And ultimately she had a bar uh, fabricated, which is shown in that x-ray. So here she is more recently with her uh, maxillary bars the, uh, on both sides and her mandibular bar uh, you know, uh, uh, show at least one side of it there and you saw her dentures in place. So getting back to what we do mostly today are the uh, cylinder implants and of course Branemark, um, P.I. Branemark was the researcher in Sweden who did uh, the uh, initial work on titanium fusion to bone uh, and ultimately this was brought to the United States in 1985 uh, where multiple studies were begun at various centers around the country. Uh, the difference in the implant here was that it was a smooth machine screw and it was placed in tapped bone so when you drilled the hole uh, you tapped it and then the implant was inserted and then covered and closed so this was done in a two-stage procedure as opposed to leaving the implant exposed which we do quite often today uh, one of the centers uh, for for uh, research was at the Mayo Clinic with my good friend Eugene Keller who ran the oral surgery program there and ultimately all of the research that was done with Branemark implants became the gold standard for comparison. This is a typical Branemark case here. You can see the implants are straight walled and uh, on this patient. This is an initial restoration of his dentition with six of the eight implants placed. A bit further in time, the large bridge he had in the maxilla was removed and other implants were placed upon which crowns were uh, fabricated. Clinically, this is what the uh, patient, okay, and you can see he has uh, uh, posteriorly there in the mandible, you can see multiple crowns that are screw plants. At that time, it didn't matter <clears throat> or it wasn't, uh, the worry was not aesthetic in, in the least. It was a matter of getting the implants to fuse the bone. If we had implants that were fused, then we'd do whatever was necessary to restore the case. In fact, these long cylinder necks were placed just to be able to get teeth up to the level of being able to be put in contact. And these, these were called high water procedures. And you can see the same thing on the other side here with quite healthy tissue and crowns screwed onto the implants. Subsequently, in the late 80s, uh, I began doing the IMZ or Interpore system. Uh, it was introduced at the American Institute of Oral Biology by Dr. Philip Boyne uh, from Loma Linda. With this, where there was a hands-on technique for uh, attendees, and we were using a non-threaded smooth surface straight wall implant that once the osteotomy was made with the drill, uh, the implants were actually malleted into place. Uh, these were supplied both as smooth surface and then HA, that's hydro hydroxyapatite uh, crystals impregnated on the surface. And there were reports at the time of problem with delamination of um, uh, implants with hydroxyapatite, but I never experienced that with any of my cases. One other uh, factor that is a little different is that these had an open end at the uh, inferior aspect to have, allow for growth for increased stabilization. Here we have, an, we have another case, okay, that's classic. In an edentulous mandible, you can see the implants are put in in parallel and bone grows through that hole at the inferior border. Uh, the attachment also, in this, rather than fabricate a bar, this, these were O-ring attachments put into the denture on each side and the to the male in a male female fashion as is shown here this picture was taken approximately 10 years post-operatively so you can see some tarnish to the metal but the soft tissue is entirely healthy this is with the denture in place and then following that for a short period of time there was also the stereo system which is very similar in design to the imz interpore uh, again, as a second generation implant, either HA coded or not. It's very much the same as the IMZ system. And here's a gentleman who came in at 32 years old with a severely. In this particular case, this young man had a uh, 
real difficulty with self-image and had let his uh, entire dentition deteriorate uh, due to having been born with a cleft lip and palate. And as a consequence of saying we had to remove all but five of his natural teeth, following which 13 implants were placed, as you can see on the slide. Ultimately, they were restored with the significantly imaginative prosthetic devices. You can see these buttons here were for securing his denture onto the bar that under the uh, same. And here are the holes that those buttons locked into. But uh, overall, there was an aesthetic, excellent aesthetic and functional result. Later in the 90s, we started doing the uh, ITI or Strawman one piece implants. And this I call the third generation implant because they were designed quite differently than everything we'd done before, in that there was no two part system. And again, they were placed at one stage and left exposed. They were very good for posterior cases. Uh, but they were not useful in the anterior maxilla, in particular due to aesthetic compromise from being hard to work with as far as the uh, placement and ultimate uh, fabrication of uh, crowns. Uh, uh, as for the implants themselves, they're threaded screws and a bit awkward to place, as I mentioned. And I've only had to, uh, two implants fracture in all these years, both of which were the ITI Strawman brand. Shortly thereafter, we started doing Nobel Pharma, which was the uh, combination of the Stereos and Nobel systems. Uh, and this was a very short-lived experience because I encountered significant difficulty uh, with respect to getting the implants to go to depth once I had uh, drill the holes. In fact, I was having to over drill the sites just to make sure I could get my implant down. And the poor product support combined with the difficult uh, accomplishments of the case, I didn't stick with these very long. So now, and for the last 10 to 11 years, I've been doing the Biomet 3i, that's Implant Innovations Incorporated system. And I call this our fourth generation titanium implant supplied as a threaded screw, either straight or tapered with a nanotite, uh, it's a brand, calcium phosphate uh, crystals impregnated into an acid etched surface. So we've gone all the way from smooth surface machined implants in the beginning, now to a rough surface acid etched um, implant that has calcium phosphate impregnated into it to enhance uh, bony end growth. Uh, they can be done as one stage uh, uh, or as two stages, but we try to do the uh, one stage as often as possible. These are, in my practice, I use the self-tapping tapered implants, uh, following which we put an ENCODE healing abutment, which is used for the restorative aspect of the case. Um, and in fact, we now do iTero scanning in my office as an alternative to conventional impressions for the dentist if they desire. Here is a typical, uh, and this is an early uh, 3i case. And here's an example of the 3i case early on, uh, where uh, she had had this restorative treatment done uh, with gold crowns in the past, and uh, one on one side. A couple here on the other, and you can see that with the magnification on the uh, um, camera, the grooves. But the important part is, is that we are able to do this as a one-stage procedure, where the tooth was taken out the same day and the implant put in, which is our primary method uh, today. Here is her post-operative Panorex, and you can see the results accomplished. This is an older style implant that was put in before she came to my office. And then these are the crowns that were put on the two implants that we placed initially in her case. Stop.